Kia ora, welcome all and thank you for joining our discussion on climate action, emerging risk and resilience challenges for organisations. I'm Alana Lafope, the Chair of the Events Subcommittee for RIMS New Zealand and Pacific Islands. In this session you will hear from the Honourable James Shaw, Minister for Climate Change and co-leader of the Green Party. Nigel Toms is the Acting Chief Financial Officer and Head of Risk and Resilience at Watercare. Nigel is the technical author of PAS 60518, Developing and Implementing Enterprise Risk and Resilience Management in Utilities. Dr Charles Earhart is Director of Sustainable Value at KPMG. Charles has 20 years experience working towards sustainable development and has spent the last 12 years focused on the challenges of mitigating and adapting to climate change. The session is moderated by Annabelle Chartres, who leads the National Sustainability and Climate Change Practice at PwC New Zealand. Annabelle is driven by finding innovative business solutions to address sustainability and climate change challenges. This webinar was a reformat of an in-person event we had hoped to deliver on 3 March 2021. Unfortunately, a lockdown in Auckland prevented us from meeting in person. Minister Shaw's segment was recorded via Zoom on 3 March and the balance of the session was recorded in person on 29 March. My warmest thanks to the speakers for making themselves available to, re to record this content. And now we begin with Minister Shaw. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, and hello, uh, my name is James Shaw, I'm the Minister for Climate Change for Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, in our last term of government, uh, as you'll know, we uh, decided that we were going to move to a system of uh, mandatory comply or explain uh, reporting for climate related risks uh, for large uh, listed companies uh, and fund managers in Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, and that we were going to uh, adopt the recommendations of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures that had been set up in 2015, launched in Paris at the Paris talks uh, that led to the Paris Agreement by Michael Bloomberg uh, and Mark Carney, who was then the governor of the Bank of England. Um, now, the proposition uh, of the task force was really quite straightforward, uh, and that is that there are globally trillions of dollars of unquantified, undisclosed risk sitting on corporate balance sheets that directors and shareholders don't know about. Uh, and that that is material uh, both to those shareholders uh, and also uh, to the health and stability of the financial system itself. So their conclusion was that we uh, ought to globally start moving to a situation where um, companies are required to uh, both uh, investigate and report uh, and disclose on uh, on those risks. Now, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, at the time that the Productivity Commission was doing its 2018 report on the transition to a low carbon economy, uh, mm -hmm. the Insurance Council um, put forward a, a submission to them as part of that report uh, that said that actually, if you think about it, these risks, if they are material, should already be being uh, disclosed uh, to directors, um, and yet they weren't. Um, and, and that's simply because there wasn't the kind of capability or awareness. And in their view uh, of the insurance uh, industry uh, was that actually we do need to move to a, a, a compulsory regime uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so uh, we adopted that recommendation and uh, in early 2020, uh, Cabinet signed off on uh, on, the, on the recommendations. Now, whilst New Zealand was the first country in the world to announce that it is going to be moving towards uh, mandatory uh, uh, climate-related financial disclosures, it is actually under active consideration by something like 60 reserve banks uh, around the world. Uh, and there are a number of other countries, I think, including the United Kingdom, uh, who have said that they will also be moving towards uh, such a regime. So this isn't something that we're doing uniquely here, uh, although we are one of the first countries that's out of the blocks. Uh, and in so doing, I think that we have an opportunity uh, to not just develop a regime that works for New Zealand, um, but that can be used uh, as guidance uh, for other countries that are uh, moving in the same direction. Um, it was really important to us in, as we sort of decided what we were going to uh, do and what form it was going to take here in New Zealand. Um, that we adopt the best practice international standard, uh, recognising that 
every economy has peculiarities that mean that a kind of an international standard might not be a perfect fit. But we felt really because capital is global and one of the chief uh, uh, reasons why we're doing this is to increase transparency for, uh, for shareholders and actually make it easier for uh, capital to um, be directed to areas which are you know, lower risk um, and, and so on, uh, that we do adopt the international system. So uh, late last year, the uh, external reporting board, the XRB, um, picked up the torch of starting to develop what that standard would look like uh, for Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, and uh, this year, the government is planning to introduce the legislation that actually uh, empowers this regime. Uh, and so we hope to have more to say about that in the coming months. Um, it is, I think, a very significant movement. Uh, one of the uh, journalists that follows climate change policy in New Zealand uh, at the end of last year when we announced this said that they thought that this was perhaps the single most significant climate policy that our government had introduced. Um, but of course, uh, because it relates to capital markets and, and shareholder transparency and so on, uh, that actually they've kind of gone under the radar because that's not that's not a very retail um, uh, area of area of policy, um, but it is very very significant in terms of where capital gets directed over the coming months, years, uh, and decades as we transition to a lower carbon economy. So I'll leave it there uh, and uh, hand over to um, my co-host uh, Annabel Chartres. Thanks very much, James, and thanks for that introduction. Um, very, very insightful. Look, one of the things you, you said was that capital is global. You know, financial markets are, by their nature, international. So how is the government going to ensure that our disclosure requirements are consistent with other countries' disclosure regimes? And I suppose linked to that, you know, what is the risk that New Zealand companies might face in being subject to these disclosures ahead of other countries. Could that impact our competitive advantage in any way? I'll start with the, the second part of that question. I, I actually think that it will be a source of competitive advantage. So if you look at uh, leading fund managers, I mean, BlackRock are the kind of leading example where, uh, you know, colossal fund uh, operates globally uh, in virtually every market where there is a market, frankly. Um, have have been really clear um, that they see uh, climate related risk as their single highest priority above all other forms of risk, um, and that they want to be directing their uh, investments obviously to areas where they can you know guarantee a better return than other things. And so I think that having a disclosure regime in New Zealand early um, will actually uh, provide uh, access to capital um, that might otherwise uh, not. You know, because um, you know we'll have a transparency regime that other markets won't. It'll it'll encourage capital to move to uh, some of the companies that are uh, uh, captured by our our regime. The other so thing is that I don't think first sorry, mover sorry. advantage. I was going to say potentially first mover advantage in that respect. I think so, and I I think you know in New Zealand we um, you know we we are a globally minded uh, country, but I think that we. I kind of haven't quite realised quite how fast the world is moving, uh, and so when you look at uh, some of the noises that are coming out of the international investment community uh, and the size of the green bond market, for example, and the rate at which that is that is growing, um, or even uh, kind of more active uh, funds like the um, at the kind of social bonds uh, kind of concepts that are starting to become popular around the place, then I think. You know, we've been almost a bit naive about just how rapidly uh, and how significant that, that movement is. So having this regime here, I, I think, will actually give first mover advantage to, to our companies. But they won't have it for long, uh, because like I said, I think the UK are only about 12 months behind us uh, in terms of their timeframes. Um, and, you know, the, the power of London uh, in the financial markets is uh, that doesn't really need commenting on. Um, and in terms of the first part of your question, how how will we ensure that sort of uh, compatibility? Well, we did have a debate when we were doing the policy formation around the regime whether we should try and develop a, a sort of a bespoke system for New Zealand um, that might you know um, kind of work more effectively for the size of our economy and the nature of our companies and so on. 
Um, but actually, we felt that uh, it was really important that we adopt the international, the emerging international standard. Um, and so, uh, I think the XRB are very aware of that, um, and will be tapping into uh, developments in, in other countries, including the Sustainable Finance Strategy in the UK and so on, so that we start to develop a, a kind of a global standard. Right. Yeah. Look. Uh, you know we are the first country to, to make this a, a mandatory requirement, but it's certainly um, something, particularly with the TCFD recommendations that's been picked up and gathered momentum globally over the last few years, particularly ac across the UK and Europe. What positive changes are you seeing in those markets or indeed other international markets that you hope to see reflected here in New Zealand, either in the near term or as we get the regime up and running? I think you've got um, extremely active fund managers who are um, putting the hard word on some of those companies that they uh, have a position in. Um, and you know, there's always, I think, companies that are exposed to a high level of risk, um, either stranded asset risk um, or, or transition risk, I think are um, at, at risk of a sort of a divestment campaign. Um, you know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but you do see uh, fund managers who are starting to say, look, we expect you to start thinking about how you're, uh, you know, uh, transitioning over to a different asset base. Um, and, uh, you know, you see a little bit of that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's not huge yet, but there is a, there is a bit of that emerging. What, one of the ones, I'm not sure about the cause and effect here, but there's been a series of announcements uh, over the course of the last 12 months from the various car manufacturers in Europe, Japan, and the United States. And I think the most recent one was, I think it was Volvo yesterday, who said that they were going to only manufacture electric vehicles from a certain date. They've all got different dates. I think the earliest is about 25, which is right mm -hmm. around the corner. Um, I think General Motors said that they were only going to start uh, only going to manufacture EVs from, I think it was 2027, that announcement came out about a month ago, uh, shortly after the Biden administration took office uh, in the US. And given the extent to which the American manuf car manufacturing industry is propped up by the US taxpayer, I suspect that there was a quiet word had in the background there. <laughs> but um, I would imagine uh, that the, um, the major uh, fund managers would have been having these conversations uh, with those companies and saying, look, you, you have a, um, a you know, significant risk here. Uh, you've got a number of countries who are saying you're not even going to be allowed to buy a internal combustion engine vehicle after a certain date. So, you know, the UK said after 2030, that's it. No, no more ICEs on uh, for sale. Um, you can still drive one around that you bought previously, but you won't be able to buy new ones. Um, and, and that obviously presents a, a significant risk to any manufacturer of internal combustion engine vehicles, which is all of them, uh, Bob Bart, a couple of others. And so I imagine that, you know, there is a journey that uh, those fund managers have gone through with those manufacturers to say, look, we need, we need you to kind of start switching your manufacturing processes pretty quickly um, because your customer base is about to dry out. Yeah, well, certainly... Uh... Uh, be a wake-up call, at least in, in this market and many others. And I suppose with that, um, you know, there's always a danger when change is being driven by policy or legislation, that you, you have a compliance culture rather than true change in the market. But climate change is quite a unique challenge we're facing into. So do you think as, as these di disclosure requirements gather momentum and companies start facing into what's required of them, that there'll be a bit of an epiphany of sorts or at least a moment of truth for New Zealand Inc. as they think about the implications of climate change? Well, I think, uh, so there's one local example that I can think of recently, which is the ACC fund, uh, which uh, last year, um, last year or even early this year, decided that they were going to uh, adopt a, a um, you know, climate risk strategy. They didn't have one at all previously, uh, they'd sort of taken a legal compliance view. You know, if it's legal um, and high return, we'll invest in it. Um, uh, and I think that they, when I mean, there was a select committee inquiry um, that uh, they had to kind of front up to, 
Um, and so I think that partially motivated them. Uh, but uh, the chair did say um, that at the board level, they kind of hadn't really considered it as important, even though there had been repeated calls for them to um, either divest from fossil fuels or to adopt a, a risk-based strategy uh, on, on climate change. Uh, and then they started to get some of the data coming through um, from, you know, other funds and so on. And, and they did say, actually, you know what, we've probably put this off too, too long. Um, there are things that we should have moved on earlier. And so um, they've now largely adopted the same strategy or a very similar strategy to the New Zealand Super Fund, which adopted it in 2016. So Super Fund's about five years ahead of, of the ACC fund. But it, it was interesting reading the interviews with ACC uh, when they announced that, um, that it did sound like there was a bit of an epiphany. It's one of those things where when you have knowledge, I mean, it's hard to have an epiphany unless you know what's going on, right? So, um, so in having a disclosure regime, I think that there will be a number of companies who didn't think that there was a problem, who when they actually get the data come through, will kind of think, oh, you know, uh oh, <laughs> there's more of a problem there than we thought. I think also in, um, in, in that respect, because climate change is so complex and there are so many risks to consider. And uh, I, what we tend to see is that an organisation will take sort of a pretty one dimensional view to start with and consider one very obvious risk, not realising that it's, it's, it's a much broader landscape that they need to be considering. Yeah, I think that's a very human thing, you know, and and uh, that's also fine with me because it, it you know it's like it's what gets you on the journey. You know, there there is a parallel. Uh, if you remember a few years ago when the government said that we were going to phase out uh, single-use plastic bags, um, and there had been there was a massive amount of public support for that, uh, and. You know, we know that plastic bags make up 1% of our plastic waste problem, right? So getting rid of plastic bags does not solve your waste problem at all. But all of the attention was on that one that one thing. Um, and we had, you know, it, like in, in many ways, when we got around to it, people just said, what took you so long? You know, it was mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. So government was a bit behind the eight ball on that. We did that. And then all of a sudden, people started seeing all of the other plastic waste around them, but they couldn't see that whilst we had this one issue of the plastic bags. And so there's now this kind of significant groundswell to move on to all other forms of plastic waste. But if we'd tried to tackle that first, we would have had a lot more resistance, you know, because you just didn't have the, the social license. Uh, and, and so I think it is um, a friend of mine who's uh, had a career in waste management said the plastic bags are a gateway drug to the broader, uh, the broader waste conversation. Um, and I sort of feel that that's a parallel to what we're doing here, which is that you pick up the thing that you that that is kind of obvious, like oh, our corporate car fleet is all internal combustion engine vehicles. You know, let's kind of swap that out. But as you kind of get into it, you start to see how the system works. Oh, no, that's a, it's a, it's a very good analogy. <laughs> um, and just on that, I mean. This climate risk journey is a really complex and complicated one. So what is the advice that, that you would give companies that are starting out on this journey? If, if they've got to choose one thing that could be their, I don't know whether it's the gateway drug, but at least the gate opener, um, what is it and how do they start that journey? Well, it's, it's capability, actually. Um, the first thing that you need is uh, someone who has single point accountability for getting this rolling across the organization and sufficient authority within the company to be able to do so. Um, and they don't need to necessarily have a background in this because virtually nobody does. You know, we're at the, at the start of something here, um, but they do need to know who to talk to. Um, and, and there are organizations out there uh, who offer uh, consulting advice um, on this, uh, and um, that market will obviously develop fairly uh, rapidly. Um, and then there are also, you know, clubs to join, like the Climate Leaders Coalition, where you've got a group of 100 and I think 20 something companies or 160 uh, companies who are all required to report on their at least their emissions profile. And so you've got, um, you know, there's there's a, a, a very broad base of companies that are in a very 
similar early starting position. So there is the kind of safety of everyone needing to learn together at the same time. Different organisations and different industries who are trying different things, and that the more you know everyone talks to each other about this, I think the, the more rapidly that capability will will develop. Um, but the very first thing is just to get started on measurement. I mean that's you know, and I, I wouldn't even worry too much about changing anything for the first 12 to 18 to 24 months. Just put in place, you know, decent measurement systems and start to gather data uh, and then um, keep your eyes open for what the data is telling you. Data is absolutely king um, with this. That's so true. Thank you very much for your insights. Kia ora. So while Minister Shaw was asked to speak um, about the big picture of climate-related financial disclosure, I've been asked to speak about some of the practical issues and what we're seeing uh, happening in, in practice right now. And I'd like to start off by uh, sharing with you just kind of four high-level observations of what we're seeing. And the very first one, obviously, is that this is something that's happening. Already, more than 110 governments around the world have indicated their support for mandatory climate-related uh, financial disclosures. We have got, uh, obviously, um, uh, legislation moving quickly forward in New Zealand. We have got uh, the UK, which about a week ago, I believe, uh, indicated that by 2023, they will begin with mandatory climate-related financial disclosure for all sectors, but starting off with financial institutions and large publicly traded companies. Um, and by 2025, that will uh, already starting with some legislation and requirements in 23. And by 25, that will be a full uh, regime aligned with the TCFD recommended framework. And last week in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission signaled their support for mandatory climate risk disclosure. So really, it's, it's not a matter of if this is going to be happening, but when and how. The second point is that you get out of it, like most things in life, uh, what you put into it. And uh, so a very light touch and a um, checkbox uh, kind of an exercise is going to generate relatively low value for, for participating organizations. So what is it that you need to put in? Well, what you need to put in is the walk, not the talk. Um, uh, the talking part is easy once you've done the hard work and gone down that, uh, that trail. And so then the final uh, high-level observation is uh, w what needs to happen first. And, and really the, the only satisfactory answer to that is just to get started on the journey. All right. So those are some high-level um, reflections on what we're seeing in practice. A little bit of sharing a stock take with you. Uh, in terms of the quantity of organizations that are uh, re beginning to disclose their climate-related financial uh, risks and opportunities, uh, some 60% of the world's 100 largest companies are now disclosing. Financial institutions with more than $150 trillion in assets are now disclosing. Some, and there's been an 84% increase in the number of uh, uh, organizations disclosing in 2020 versus um, 2019. So the quantity of disclosure is rapidly uh, improving. The fall down has been around the quality of reporting. We're still not getting sufficient disclosure to meet the primary uh, purpose of the TCFD uh, initiative, which is to provide financial markets with the information they need to allocate capital wisely. So let's go in a little bit uh, to that issue of quality uh, or the nature of disclosure, what's being, um, uh, what's being shared. Um, now, the TCFD, the, the task force, uh, has been one party that has now um, done a survey looking at what are some of the fall down points, what are some of the big challenges that organizations are finding in practice. And, um, some high-level uh, takeaways from those analyses have been that organizations are particularly struggling to identify their risks and opportunities in a robust way. And second, they are struggling to undertake uh, um, robust scenario-based analysis 
um, strategic level uh, risks and opportunities. So the TCFD is recommended scenario-based approach to analyzing um, strategy uh, or organization level um, uh, risks and opportunities. And that's really been a struggle for a lot of organizations for a number of different reasons, uh, including the lack of data in some cases, but also simply a familiarity with this scenario-based approach. The second challenge um, that we're seeing building on that, uh, which relates in particular to uh, organizations in the financial services sector is around portfolio level risk and opportunity assessment. So if you think that this is challenging for a single organization to understand their risk and risks and opportunities and to undertake a scenario based analysis for what this might mean for them at a strategy level, imagine trying to do that uh, across a portfolio of uh, insured entities or, um, or or lendees, for instance. Um, so uh, that those two challenges that I mentioned are particularly uh, um, significant uh, with additional dimensions uh, for organizations in the financial services sector. Um, third is that the existing risk management tools that organizations have uh, in their kind of tool belt are not fit for purpose. So many of those risk management tools first off, simply don't deal with the time frames that we're talking about here with climate-related risks and opportunities. Many of those uh, traditional risk management tools are short-sighted, but they're also um, uh, siloed within an organization. So you may be looking or your, your tools may be designed to look at operational risks or, or, or financial risks. Um, and so they're really, they, they don't capture, they don't provide us with actual tools or experience that accommodate well to dealing with the nature of the challenges posed by climate change. And then the fourth main practical challenge that we're finding is that organizations simply don't know what good looks like. So this is a, a very new demand and even those organizations that are saying that we would like to disclose um, to, uh, uh, to, to a high quality, they don't know what, uh, what that high quality looks like. And they, um, examples can be, they simply don't know what are examples of a good climate disclosure that they can look at and try to emulate or aspire to. They also don't know uh, where the guidance may be on the broad types of changes that they need to uh, face into or step into. So those are the main practical challenges that we're seeing. Finally, um, I've been asked, well, what are some of the, the, the typical questions that clients uh, come up with? And the, the first question that uh, I, I think the, the most consistent question that we are asked is um, if we disclose or when we disclose our climate related risks and opportunities, should they be mainstreamed into our annual report or should we have a standalone document or should they be mainstreamed brought into our sustainable uh, or sustainability reporting uh, instruments? And the answer to that is that it doesn't matter. What does matter is that uh, wherever your climate-related disclosures are placed, they need to be clear to serve that purpose of communicating to stakeholders what's going on. So certainly that means that they may be, or the climate uh, risk disclosures may be placed in any number of different papers. What doesn't work is if they are embedded and spread throughout these documents because they won't tell that coherent, uh, clear story uh, to, uh, to stakeholders, whether it's investors or, or others. The second question that we are frequently asked is, well, what do we do first? And I think that there are many different opinions about what is most important for organizations to tackle uh, right off the bat for myself based on the conversations that I've had with uh, reporting organizations or organizations that are gearing themselves up to report, to me the most important thing is the governance. 
if you get, if the board and management team understands what's required and what's at stake, they will support other activities. If they don't understand that, then everything else becomes an uphill struggle, whether it's simply uh, gathering information, so measurement and monitoring, um, or if it is taking that in-depth look at risks and opportunities. If they're not on board, everything else is going to be an uphill struggle, and the significance of each of those other activities will be undermined if the board and senior management team is not fully uh, supportive. Um, the third question that we are frequently asked is um, about whether risk, uh, um, risk management processes should be mainstreamed or if you need to have standalone or if you should have standalone climate related risk management processes. It doesn't matter. If you've already got good risk management processes, by all means, they, your, your the way that you deal with climate risks can be mainstreamed. But this is an opportunity to think about whether or not existing risk management processes are sufficiently robust. Um, the final question that we are getting an increasing number of clients asking is how do we quantify our climate-related risks and opportunities? The simple answer to that is nobody knows. Um, our, there are issues around the methodology, uh, first and foremost. How would you do that? Um, and then even if you had a robust methodology for some risks or opportunities, there would still be many risks and opportunities that don't really lend themselves in the first place to clear quantification. And aside from that, another layer is that in the New Zealand market, we lack some of the data that other larger markets have. So that is yet another way, reason why quantifying risks are, uh, will be particularly challenging to us. That shouldn't, though, be seen as a barrier or an obstacle to moving forward. Simply get on with it. Methodologies, if they transpire, uh, will evolve in due course. But uh, in the meantime, what we can do through a uh, qualitative assessment of climate risks and opportunity, opportunities is to trigger the conversations that matter with the people that matter as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, my name's Nigel Toms. I'm Acting Chief Financial Officer at Watercare. And I'm going to take a look at it from the water care's perspective, both in terms of climate change and then latterly in terms of how we might deal with the climate reporting. Uh, fundamental, however, is our requirement that the actual reporting drives benefit and action rather than preventing benefit and action. So just as a starting point, there's the first slide. And it'll show you uh, some solar array projects that we've done recently. Um, interestingly, three of them were done as part of bigger projects. The fourth one was a standalone. I'll come back and explain later on why there's a difference there between them. Uh, but moving on, um, just to have a look at Watercare. Watercare is the biggest uh, water and wastewater provider in New Zealand. Uh, what you can see in front of you is a sky to sea diagram. And from it, you'll see that uh, we have some interesting challenges. Watercare is reliant on rainwater. So uh, very dry conditions are challenging. And at the other end of the scale, uh, most of our wastewater assets rely on gravity. So they tend to be low lying, which means that um, the end points are um, possibly vulnerable to sea level rise. So what are our challenges? Because we've all been talking about reporting about climate change and, and uh, giving the financial markets information. But the actual risks are fairly simple. So the first is that wet periods are going to be wetter. And I know that seems slightly strange at the moment in the middle of a drought, but trust me, wet periods will be wetter. Dry periods will be longer. Uh, sea levels will rise. Some level of sea level rise is already built in. And weather events will be more sudden and more severe. So not only may you get a wetter period, you might get a month's worth of rain in a day. So these are considerable challenges for all of the utilities across New Zealand. So when we think about understanding these risks, uh, in days gone by we took the risks and talked about mitigation actions, but now we begin to risk, um, link risk to resilience. Because what we're looking to do for the future 
is that we're intending to understand the risk and make ourselves more resilient over time. Um, what we're hoping to do is that we can actually resist and therefore whatever the situation is, we can deal with it. But in reality, there will be times when we have to uh, respond and recover because our systems, no matter how robust we make them, can't cope. It is worth pointing out, however, that resisting involves more infrastructure. And more infrastructure, when you report it, can have exactly the opposite effect when it comes to, to climate change reporting, because building things has a carbon impact, uh, amongst other things, that you could find yourself that your reporting clashes with your desire to bring more resilience to the party. So taking one example, I mentioned it before, the drought in 2020, if we then consider the challenges that this brings for us, Responding to a drought sounds simple. You can only do two things. You can either reduce demand, which means that people want less water from your systems, or you can increase supply, which means you find a way to put more water out there for people to use. In reality, you've got to do both of those things at the same time, and you've got to keep doing them until such time as the drought passes and your water supplies are back to a safe level. And as I said, if we look at the biggest climate risk we probably face going forward, we could be looking at that going on for a number of years. And therefore, the level of resilience that you have to build into your systems by default increases if you want to manage that drought. So water care has been at that for a long time. Uh, we've been bringing more water from renewable sources. And you'll see in front of you um, the amount of water we now draw from the Waikato River. But you should understand that it's actually quite a resource-hungry process because the Waikato River that we're drawing from is, say, 30 kilometers from here. And we've got to pull that water out of the river, treat it through our systems, and pump it all the way to Auckland. And that has a significant power footprint, which, of course, if you were reporting it, if you wanted more of that, then your actual um, reporting would increase. It would show you increasing your, your level of um, power which of course would kind of go against what some of that report, what, what the reporting is hoping to aspire to. Uh, in terms of ways to reduce demand, um, whilst reporting might help you, in reality, the real ways to, to, to do this are in communications. What you're looking to do is you're looking for people to understand their water footprint and then to reduce their water usage over time. One of the most powerful groups interestingly, has got nothing to do with the financial markets. The most powerful group is school children, because school children understand the bit about being greener better than their parents. And if you go to the schools and, and give them education, they then go home and nag their parents, which is what you're not allowed to do directly. And it has a much bigger impact than people realize. So this whole demand exercise has to go on and communications as you'll be aware are not um, cheap to do and they have to continue not just when the drought is on but because you want people to make permanent changes to their behavior you're going to have to make them continue that when the drought finishes and no amount of financial disclosure will necessarily make any difference to the using public so then we come to increasing supply so increasing supply, for the most part, is really about building new sources and getting water from new renewable supplies. But then, if you do that, you have to understand that that means building uh, more treatment plants. It means building more pipe infrastructure to move that water around. And if you're using more water, you're going to have more wastewater, so you're going to have to treat that as well. Um, to give you an idea, uh, we had about 650 megalitres capacity. Um, in the last year, we brought, we've brought, we've, we have brought on about another 110 megs, which if, if you want to think about it in scale terms, that's about two and a half times Tauranga. And that's the kind of increases that people will be looking at in future in order to manage drought and the challenges with water, especially as you're in Auckland, and this is 45% of the country's GDP in one place, running out of water and the impacts on business, simply not accept acceptable going forwards. <coughs> so what about um, 
the, the business of building new utility capability. Well, you'll see in front of you there a headline from the New Zealand Herald, which says water bomb as cost of fixing crisis hits $224 million. I was the person who put that proposal to the council and uh, that was the headline that resulted. And I can tell you that in financial markets terms, 110 extra megs for $224 million is cheap. Believe me when I explain to you that infrastructure by its very nature to make you resilient is inherently expensive. And it's not going to get any less expensive as the world demands more of it in order to deal with global warming. So what about for the future? Well, we're going to have to start looking at lots of different ways to manage the um, drought. But some of these um, ways are actually even more resource hungry than the ones we've done at the moment. So if we want to take water from seawater, which means re removing the salt, that is furiously expensive in terms of the amount of power you're going to have to apply to make it happen. Uh, other um, areas that you might want to consider, uh, and I've listed a few of them, are um, using more out of river sources. But again, there are political issues related to that. Uh, but also, of course, uh, reuse of wastewater. Probably the most viable option for the future, but a number of groups quite rightly have concerns and really don't look upon that as something that they, they want to do. However, if we were living in Singapore, you'd be doing it every day. So again, the problem with some of these is they're more expensive than our current supplies. And if we were reporting them, there'd be a concern that you're actually making yourself look worse as you did the right thing to improve your resilience going forward. Now, it's also worth reminding um, people that part of this is going to be beyond our capability to deal with ho however much um, infrastructure we put in. And the reason for that is that um, if you get a sudden or severe event, you're only going to be able to manage that with your people, processes, and systems. And this is about building adaptive capacity. It'll happen. You'll never have seen it before. You will have to manage it. It will undermine conf and confidence in markets if you can't. You will have to put people in place who have the wherewithal to bring groups together to, to do things differently with your existing capability and manage that situation so that people can still get their water and wastewater services. So I'm not going to cover all of these in detail, but I would point out that there are some things that we could do which are fairly simple. Uh, one of them is that we don't use our networks. And even if we all reported the same way, none of us would pick up the phone and speak to our utilities around the country and actually ask for help unless we were forced to do so. And yet, seeking assistance is a strength. It's not a weakness. And the other thing is that as we go forward, the more standardization we've got, the more robust we become. So have, having everyone in the country with different componentry so that we can't swap it over is actually problematic. And it also makes it cheaper when it comes to purchasing it, if that's the, if that's the position that you can adopt. <clears throat> so some of the thinking that I've been talking about is held within a piece of work that I did recently. So I was the technical author of PAS 60518, which is entitled um, Developing and Implementing Enterprise Risk and Resilience in Utilities. The um, diagram that I talked about, talking about linking risk and resilience and all of the other work rests within that. And I think we're going to see more and more organizations taking this kind of approach, but having to weave through a minefield when it comes to the um, reporting of um, climate change in whatever form it comes to us, the difference between becoming more resilient and at the same time perhaps changing the carbon footprint the wrong way. So lastly, just, just to, to finish off in, in terms of how we think about this, um, from a, an industry point of view, we don't want to make matters worse. So one of the things we do want to do is make sure we understand where the risks actually are. And climate change reporting will help with part of that, but part of that is within our own responsibility to make sure we understand what we're doing and where those vulnerabilities lay. Um, we should make those risk profiles visible. Now here, climate change reporting will help, but will it have enough granularity to inform investment decisions internally rather than just reporting in big picture terms to, to an outside group? 
We should set the rules for future capital investment to make sure that we don't pull back and that we're not swayed from the path of improving our resilience over time because we are in conflict with any of the financial reporting that we're doing. And also, we shouldn't delay planned investment. That's particularly important because you will hear things about adaptive planning. And you may find that, of course, the markets are saying that they're not particularly keen to lend based on what we're telling them at a particular point in time. And I think one of the key things we've got to think about is that that investment is key and it must continue. And lastly, um, in terms of supporting and protecting climate change investment, at the very beginning I showed you a couple of solar array projects. Three of them, the first three, are all directly related to other larger projects where the solar array was a component. And there was no issue at all getting those through. However, when the project stands alone, you're going to build a, a large solar array on its own merits to, do, to support an existing plant, there's always a great temptation that that investment gets moved to the right because there are other things which seem to be more pressing. And I think we've got to make rules that say, if that was that important then we're going to deliver it in that year, that's what we should do. And I think there, the climate change reporting becomes more beneficial because if you're reducing your risk profile as a result of investment and that's reflected in the reporting, then that's beneficial going forward. So that's it from me. I'm always so happy to talk to people and share ideas. Um, I've put my contact details. If you want to contact me, please do. Thank you. Charles and Nigel, thanks very much for the very insightful presentations. Really, really interesting to get your perspectives. Charles, picking up on something you said um, at the start of, of your presentation, the need to, to demonstrate the walk, not just the talk. How well do you think New Zealand Inc. Is, is positioned to disclose and how much walking is actually happening in this country at the moment? Mm -hmm. So when I address that issue later on, I, I distinguish between quantity and quality. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure that we're quite where we need to be either in terms of quantity or quality. Um, certainly we are seeing a, a rapid uptake of organizations that are um, moving towards disclosure. And, um, and, and that can be in two forms. And I think both at this stage in the game are equally valid. So we're seeing organizations that are beginning to uh, provide disclosures along with annual reports, for example. But we're also seeing a lot of organizations that are working behind the scenes and they are putting in place the right systems and structures they are uh, putting reports up to the board um, and providing metrics and having those metrics uh, assured, for example, just trying to get their house in order in preparation for robust uh, disclosure when that becomes uh, mandatory. So both those things are happening behind the scenes and in, in, in so that quantity is, is building. Um, but we are seeing that most common amongst organizations, for example, that are a subsidiary of foreign, yeah, they're foreign owned, right? So what's happening is that they're Australian owned or, or whatever, they're getting the finger pushed upon them to say, start moving. So we almost need to distinguish in the New Zealand market between those organizations that are beginning to move towards disclosure or ready themselves for disclosure because it's an external push or if it's something that's, that's more of an indigenous kind of flowering, a recognition of need and, and response, we're not seeing that. Yep. So um, more of those domestic uh, companies, um, we're, we're not yet seeing them move forward. We are seeing some interesting steps in the public sector, which is interesting because that's not exactly what TCFD was intended for, but it's really interesting and, and it really speaks to their sense of need for transparency and accountability. So that's good. But even those organizations that we are seeing that are beginning to disclose and to a degree those that are still doing so in-house as they try to get their uh, get things in order, there is still a real struggle with quality of what they're doing. And again, a, a big part of that is because they're grappling with this question, what does good look like? Right? So we know we want to do this, but we're not really sure what good looks like, what, what, what are the standards, um, whether it's on governance or scenario uh, analysis, what does it mean to do that well? And certainly 
um, we have seen a number of instances where um, organizations are saying, look, these are our risks and opportunities. This is our scenario uh, uh, analysis. And you ask, well, how did you derive that? And so well, we got a few people around it. It just, it, it's not yet robust, right? But they, the important thing is that once they get moving and they look at that, they reflect on it, and then frequently they'll say, yeah, we need to up, up the game. And Nigel, from Watercare's perspective specifically, how, how are you as an organization walking the talk, both internally and driving behavior change, but also in, in your climate-related financial disclosure journey? Um, so if we think about it in terms of board governance, there is a climate action subcommittee now in place. And with board and executive representation, we also have a number of staff whose jobs specifically relate to this. So we've, we've um, upskilled, brought in some, some very capable expertise to help guide us on that journey. Uh, we have begun the business of disclosing, and I accept that this is a, a journey that's continuing, take, taking the, the comments that have just been made, but we've begun that process. Um, in terms of how we go forward, I think that one of the keys to driving internal behaviours is for people to be able to actually see what the challenge is. And it doesn't have to be clever. Uh, and we were debating this um, on top of the, the normal disclosures that were asked for. Um, if we're worried about um, sea level rise, um, if we knew the value and position of all those assets that would, or should we say one meter or below, and you set that as a metric, and then we said, well, okay, in two years' time, because remember we have an asset management plan which upgrades assets. When that asset came for upgrade, sensibly, not we didn't even put the program forward, would we find ourselves in a position where I'm watching that value drop? Did my, did my investment reduce the risk profile? When I came to replace that asset, did I put it somewhere else? Remember what I said about making matters worse? It's a challenge. And I think that, that once we begin to see more and more visibility of things like that, first of all, it helps with those financial disclosures because you can see in real time that the risk profile is falling, which is exactly what the uh, markets are looking for. They're, they're probably working out themselves how to get the right metric. So if you offer them something which, which is obviously relevant, they might be inclined to, to, to consider it. Um, but I think the most important from an internal perspective is that once staff get what you're trying to do and they can see what target they're shooting at, then I think you'll actually see much more meaningful behaviour. I think while it's a, an amorphous, we, we get the idea but we're not quite sure how you get there, that's not so useful. So the more accurate and focused it is to start with, the better it is. That cause and effect almost, doesn't it? It is, and I think then of course it, it plays into your hands in terms of the financial markets because infrastructure, as I said, is expensive. We're going to have to invest more. If you can borrow beneficially because they can see the risk profile coming down and your green credentials are improving, that has to be beneficial as well. And I believe you know, Auckland Council, who is the CCO parent, has recently done a very successful green bond issue based on work they've already done. So they are beginning to capitalise. Thank you. So it's back to you. It's, it's, it's one thing to have a compliance regime emerging in New Zealand uh, around climate risk disclosure. However, as we're only too aware, New Zealand is a little late to the party with, with some of this. Um, how is the more advanced progress or the maturity that's happening in international markets actually already starting to impact New Zealand companies? Mm -hmm. um, great question. Well, we're, we're seeing this in a, in a few different ways. And a, an example that really helps me put this in context is that while New Zealand is uh, quite forward thinking in terms of regulatory approach to this. Um, we've got other countries, well, let me put it this way. Australia is behind us in terms of a coordinated at, at national level uh, um, uh, policy or position around climate risk disclosure. It doesn't matter. The markets are speaking very strongly in Australia and we're seeing businesses respond to that in New Zealand, we've got the um, uh, regulations that are moving forward, and we're not seeing uh, 
we're not seeing the, the organizations, the market, the, certainly not the uh, local companies that are keeping up and the implication for them abroad is that it's making it, well, we're already seeing examples where it is either making it more difficult for them to access capital or it is making them it, it more difficult for them to access less expensive capital, right? Either way, regardless of what happens with the timeline uh, for our regulatory framework and whether XRB, for instance, provides standards, what we're already seeing, beginning to see in the New Zealand market is that for us to be able to access relatively inexpensive international capital, we need to come to this party and we need to produce those high quality uh, reports. And, and basically it's about telling the story to investors or potential lenders or insurers that we understand what our risks and opportunities are. We've got a plan for dealing with them and we're executing that plan. That's, that's what it all comes down to needing to do. And it, it might be worth adding that we could be forced to the table because the insurance market will insure what they could look upon as good risk and they're becoming increasingly nervous around um, various parts of climate change and what and risk those assets are exposed to. So whether we like it or not, when they say, well, we won't insure that anymore and put you in that position, you might have to start changing whether you like to or not. So you're right, you might as well get on with it. We are going to have to disclose and the better the quality of that information and the more we understand, the better. Absolutely. And, and not just the insurers, the reinsurers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Right. That, the wider that market. The, no, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Oh, very good points. Nigel, just on that, that risk piece, what are some of the risks New Zealand faces if it actually doesn't permanently change its behaviour in terms of water use? Because New Zealand companies are going to have to start thinking about that and considering it in their, um, their risk disclosure statements. Do you think they're sort of aware of what those risks are? Right, so it's, it's a very mixed economy. So water care works very closely um, with its commercial customers on a continuing basis and, and the the, the reasons for that are twofold. First of all, because they're very big, powerful customers, uh, but, but more importantly, is they're big users. So when you want to save water in a drought, one of the key groups that you want to be locking in with and that you want to take action are those big commercial groups. So I think, um, based on our experience, they were incredibly helpful to us through the drought, and um, some of them have definitely taken action to lock in permanent savings for the future. Um, but it's not consistent across all industries, and it's certainly not consistent across the country, because it really depends on where industries are based and, of course, what their access is to water. So I think the key going forward is the use of the stories and the benefits that we've gained to be spread to other um, organizations in similar industries. The problem with it, of course, is that it's a source of competitive advantage against other people in the same industry. So there is that. Um, on the one hand, it would be really good for New Zealand if we had a leading organization that saves a lot of water by developing new practices. But at the same time, of course, that is the very thing that's giving them advantage in the market. Would they be willing to disclose it? And I think that obviously it's not for the water, the water companies to encourage and actively support those as they, as they go forward and, and locking in those savings for the future that are permanent with changes in the way they process, changes in the way they use their water, but at the same time to try and encourage the spreading of the knowledge. And I think that, that as we go forward, that desire on, on the part of industry groups to work together is a very powerful um, lobby, but you've got to persuade them to, to, you know, if they've invested a lot of money in a new technique, that, that they're willing to share that with others. And, and I think that the water companies need to keep pressing to make sure that all of those commercial customers are on board. They understand the benefit for New Zealand, not just the benefit for themselves. There's certainly, it, it's very clear that collaboration and cooperation is going to drive success um, in responding to climate change. Um, Absolutely. And it, it's not enough for competitive advantage to be a reason for not working with others. Absolutely. And, and going forward, I think that the water companies themselves, however, and you'll be aware that there's talk of water reform, but at the moment we're in the very early stages, so nobody's really sure where that's going to go. But there should be um, 
a desire on the part of whatever organizations are formed that they would share that knowledge. They're not competitors with each other because they'll be regionally based if, if that's the way it goes, um, but a desire to show what industry best practice is and what can be done. Charles, a final question for you. I think um, most people are aware of what uh, physical risk is when we talk mm -hmm. about climate change. It's fairly obvious. But there's also this category of transition risk that I think is a lot less obvious. And I know we've discussed before that we're, we're seeing a lot of clients who are just focusing on one risk category, and it tends to be that you know, physical piece. Can you talk a little bit around what transition risk is and how companies should be thinking? about that mm. um, as part of the whole disclosure right? mm. Absolutely. Um, look, and, and I think that um, to, what I can share is how the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure has spoken about transition risks and then kind of pull out some different ways of, of looking at it, complementary. Um, and so the, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure distinguishes between those physical risks, things like right, sea level rise, rising temperatures, shifting rainfall patterns, and well, frankly, a big, great big uh, category of everything else. So as uh, those physical risks kick in, as uh, consumers become more concerned and start to prefer some pro uh, products and avoid other products, um, as certain technologies become less and less uh, valuable within a, uh, a market or within economies that are transitioning to, to low emissions. Um, so you've got social license to operate, you've got uh, shifting consumer preferences and prejudices, you've got uh, risks of stranded assets, you've also got risks of being sued. You also have risks of a financial penalty from failing to comply with climate-related regulations. And then all of this as well um, uh, related to capital, right? So if you are not seen as an organization that understands your risks and has got a plan for dealing with them, you may still be able to access capital, but you'll do so under uh, less preferable terms, right? So all of these things can be considered transition-related risks. Um, but we find it helpful to actually disaggregate that further um, into uh, legal risks and capital risks and well, kind of that remaining pool of, of transition risks. And the reason that we do that is that we believe that there are some kinds of risks that simply need to be managed, right? Like sea level rise or um, uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, uh, cost of falling foul of regulatory requirements, just don't do it or just start the best thing. Yeah. Um, but there are other risks that through ambitious early action, you can actually flip them into opportunities. So you can actually increase your social license to operate through early action. You can become a product or a service or a business that investors want to put money behind through showing that you're ahead of the game, distinguishing yourself in the market. Um, so that's the distinction between uh, physical and transition risks and why we are, you know, that, that's, that those transition risks, that is the landscape to explore and to find those opportunities, which are definitely out there. Thank you. Yeah, and it's certainly why the, the task force refers to these as both risks and opportunities as well. They're mm -hmm. not both.